welcome to our first speaker series of the new year. Uh, those of you who have been to the speaker series know that we usually have one speaker, um, but because of the nature of the uh, debate that we're going to talk about tonight, we have two speakers. Uh, so we'll have more of a conversation than a presentation. Uh, we're joined by UCLA, UCLA professors uh, Glenn McDonald uh, and John Christensen. Uh, who recently found themselves at the center of a debate over the importance of and relevance of the legacy of John Muir. Muir is largely seen as the patron saint of environmentalism. He became famous for saving Yosemite and influencing countless preservation movements across the U.S. However, it's 100 years since his death and times have changed. So the question becomes, is his legacy still relevant? Before I turn it over to both Glenn and John, let me tell you a little bit about them. Glenn McDonald is the John Muir Chair, Memorial Chair of Geography and a UCLA Distinguished Professor. He is a former UC Presidential Chair and former Director of the UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. His research focuses on climate change, its causes and its impact on the environment and society. John Christensen Christensen is an adjunct pro assistant professor in the, at, in the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability, Department of History, and the Center for Digital Humanities at UCLA. He is currently finishing a book titled Critical Habitat, A History of Thinking with Things in Nature. He is engaged <coughs> in multi multidisciplinary digital environmental humanities research project on nature in cities, as well as a large collaborative project to crowdsource a new public environmental history of the San Francisco Bay Area. Welcome, thank you thank for you. being here. It's a pleasure. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Glenn and John and have them give you a presentation uh, before we get into the discussion. Well, thank you very much. I, I wanna thank Claire and I wanna thank the Manzanita Institute and School for inviting us here. It's, it really is a pleasure and thank you all for coming out this evening. I'm not sure we're going to duke it out too much, but I think that we, we hope to stimulate some, some thinking and critical thinking and, and good thinking and, and discussion and debate. So, so welcome and, and, and let's do that. I, I want to say a few things about Muir, the context, what's happened in the hundred years since, since he passed away and, uh, and what, what I think are, are some valid criticisms and what are the things we should still bring forward from his legacy that can serve us well in the 21st century. Now, for those of you who didn't know, John Muir died in Los Angeles. He died in Los Angeles Christmas Eve in uh, 1914. He was visiting his daughter here. And when he died, he uh, was working on a, on a manuscript about Alaska. We in California associate him very much with the Sierras, but he was really fascinated by Alaska and, and went there on a number of occasions. Now, the question is, 100 years after John Muir died, mm -hmm. We have a lot of schools named after him, parks and things like that. We've probably read snippets, maybe some of us have read My First Summer in the Sierra. He is a prodigious writer, probably no one here has written, read everything that, that, he, that he wrote. Uh, but he has a deep Im impact on us, whether we quoting him or we're just thinking about ideas that he put forward and that then became how Americans um, define nature and how we define conservation and how we go about doing it. But a lot has changed. And, and let's just look at that a little bit to understand what a different world we're in. When Muir was writing, uh, there were about three million people in California. Now, it was the most populous of the Western states, of course, but imagine that. That's less than a tenth of the number of people in the state today. And uh, by 2050, <coughs> we're anticipating there'll be some 50 million people in the state. The pressures on these wildland environments that he so treasured, these environments that were, you know, untr un not untrammeled, but were unchanged by human activity, uh, is immense. And whether he could have imagined a state that would have had an order of magnitude more people in it, I I'm not really sure. When we look at, then, the places that he well, thought was sacred, in a sense, um, Yosemite, of course, immediately comes to mind. Now. It wasn't until the 1950s and 60s till the visitorship to Yosemite rose to the millions of people. It certainly wasn't anything like that in Muir's day. And it reached a peak of over four million people in the 1990s, and then actually has descended a bit. And for various reasons, 
but we're still seeing close to four million visitors a year and much of that concentrated in the Yosemite Valley. This is just a picture of tourism at Muir's time. Remember Muir initially made a living as a guide there, as a naturalist guiding tourists there. This was part and parcel of, of how he kept body and soul together. Now as a scientist, Muir was an interesting fellow. He's known both in botany and in geology. And of course he's known for having won the debate against Whitney, who was the state geologist, about the glacial origins of the Yosemite Valley. <clears throat> He's also famous for finding the first living glacier in the Sierra Nevada. And uh, the fact of the matter is that that glacier has disappeared now. And the glaciers in the Sierra Nevada, due to climate change, we were predicting somewhere between 5 degrees Fahrenheit winter warming and 7 degrees Fahrenheit summer warming, those glaciers are disappearing. When they will all disappear, it's uncertain. But there is the potential that every single glacier in the Sierra Nevada will disappear. And the Black Mountain Glacier, the one that, that Muir discovered, uh, is already gone. As climate is warming in the 21st century, and again, this is something Muir could not have anticipated, the life zones, the vegetation that he treasured, the high alpine vegetation, potentially will be replaced by forested vegetation lower elevation forests will potentially be replaced by other vegetation types, and there will be a huge change in the Sierra Nevada. Mm -hmm. The environment itself in the Sierra is changing. The giant sequoia groves, which Muir so treasured, and he wrote and published scientific articles about how they came to their distribution, which he felt was a relic of glaciation. We now believe that they are very, very tightly controlled by climate and by the level of the inversion layer over the uh, Central Valley. As that changes, the life zone that they live in may disappear, and also they are very susceptible to pathogens under warm temperatures. Muir planted one in his uh, home in Martinez. They're trying to clone that now because it can't survive under warm temperatures. Mm -hmm. The vegetation he loved could disappear. But there's more profound things happening than that in terms of our capacity to cope with preservation and conservation of the environment, with climate change, uh, with the challenges that we face. And that is uh, our fiscal capacity. Muir um, was a great believer in the role of the federal government for preserving the nature he treasured so much, hence his, his push to the Park Service. And yet, when you look at Muir's time, 1914, our federal debt stood at about 4% of the gross domestic product. Today, it's at 70% of the gross domestic product. The appetite, and some could argue the capacity, of the government, whether at the state or the federal level, for big projects, for big initiatives, to face the big challenges that climate change is putting on uh, environment, may have passed. It's certainly a very different world. You have members of the uh, Congress calling for the sale of some national park lands and things like that, questioning whether the federal government should own any, any park lands, and you have just stark economic facts that our debt ratio is so much higher than it was in Muir's time. Muir could also be said to be the author of some of the difficulties we're facing in conservation in California, particularly in the Sierra Nevada. He um, and on one level, understood that Native peoples had been robbed of their lands and at a sort of a theoretical level understood that. But in his writings, particularly for California Indians, he's not particularly complimentary. And he certainly didn't pay much attention to their role in ecosystems in terms of fire and set fires and keeping Yosemite Valley clear of vegetation that provided the, the meadows and things like that, which provided these fantastic views. What we're seeing then is he and Gordon Pinchot put into place the smoky bear idea, keep fire out. That has led then to a buildup of fuel, buildup of pathogens, and really severe challenges to the forest of the Sierra Nevada that he loved so much. Now that uh, Smokey the Bear philosophy has been put aside, but the cost of forest thinning is just unbelievably high. And so we will have these large, huge fires, which Muir would have been abhorred by. But in, in, in a sense, he was partially the author for the forest management pro, uh, uh, programs we had in the 20th century. Muir also, he had a very dissected view 
of the state or of the of the sort of land surface in which is there were farmlands, there was you know, agricultural fields, areas where you had resource extraction of one sort or the other. Typically, thought, and this is his, his farm, his ranch in uh, Martinez. Then there were wildland areas, the, you know, the Sierra Nevada, where you went to get away from all of that. And then there were the cities. Now, he didn't really write glowingly about cities, but he spent much of his life living in San Francisco. And, uh, and so, uh, but he, we still carry that with us, and maybe John will speak about more about that. We don't, it, we don't see nature all around us, and we maybe don't feel we're part of nature because nature for Muir was a place you went to and discovered elsewhere. Now, this may be that um, um, the town that he was born in grew up until he was 11 in Scotland was a rather bleak place and surrounded mainly by barley fields and things like that. Um, and, you know, the city of Los Angeles and San Francisco, perhaps in the uh, early 20th century, maybe weren't that compelling. But if you, if you go back and look at late 19th century, early 20th century, Los Angeles and San Francisco, there was green space. There was nature there, but he never really celebrates it. And yet this is a way to connect people with the environment, with nature. It's interesting to read Muir and look for his comments on the Californinos, the Mexican Americans, people of Hispanic or Latino background in California. It's pretty much absent. He pretty much doesn't see it. His audience and what he sees are typically white, Anglo, European, uh, uh, Californians and Americans and, and Europeans. And his choir that he preached to were powerful. And they were the powerful, politically powerful and, and uh, economically powerful. And they were, they were principally white. And uh, you, know, you only see glimpses. He talks about Los Angeles at one point and says, you know, where you see adobes, cheek and jowl with uh, clapboard houses. He doesn't talk about the people living there. And you wonder what, what he thought or made of that. But the fact of the matter is the demography of the nation is changing. And organizations such as the Sierra Club, Nature Conservancy, reflect in general a white demographic and an older demographic. Mm -hmm. National park visitation reflects that. A 2009 study shows that 78% of the visitors to the nation's national parks were white. This is a time when 64% of the population were white. African American Hispanics are greatly underrepresented the figures are almost exactly the same for California, despite the fact we even have a larger uh, Hispanic population than the rest of the nation. About 77% of park visitorship is white. What's even more troubling is a survey was done about attitudes towards National Park Service, and um, by two to three times as much, people of color, Hispanic, African American people, felt uncomfortable with National Park Service facilities and uh, structure, whereas it was just a minuscule percentage that felt that way uh, amongst uh, Anglos. That's very interesting and something we have to confront. The demography of the nation is changing. We know the demography of the state is changing. We will be a, a, a plurality and a majority Hispanic as we move through this century. Why the disconnect then uh, from, from parks, and please don't say it's because these people don't care about conservation. They don't care about environment. Uh, polls show Hispanics, Latinos, have a much stronger commitment uh, to environmental issues uh, than uh, average uh, uh, Anglo-American. So we really have some work to do there, and there's a whole group of people Muir just didn't seem to see, and probably don't feel that he's speaking to them, unfortunately. Muir also wrote a lot about being alone out in nature, being out there, you know, you're out, you're on your own. You're like the typical backpacker doing the Pacific Crest tra Trail by yourself. And later on, we can discuss why I think he did that. But the fact of the matter is, lots of groups, nature is a shared experience. And it's a place that you want to do things with your family, with your friends. And the model that you have to go conquer it alone, far away from everything else, that may be not that good. And if you look at numbers of backcountry backpackers and things like Yosemite, 
You see that it's small, or overnight visitors in Yosemite. You see that it's small. There are other ways to enjoy nature besides being <laughs> the, uh, the sole lonely uh, uh, person there. Now, we can look at some things he did do, though. And you can't dispute this. National Park Service, as we know, it comes into existence in 1916. Of course, Yosemite was made a national park by his push. He wrote a great book on the national parks. He really was uh, instrumental, amongst other people, in getting that put up. In California, we have over 7 million, 500 ac uh, seven, uh, seven, uh, million acres of National Park Service land we can thank Muir for. Even Pinchot's U.S. Forest Service has put a great deal of land aside now uh, as wilderness areas. That's an indisputable legacy. When you actually get into Muir a little bit more, you see that he did lots of group activities. There was a lot of group uh, hikes. There were local group hikes. There were lots of things with the whole family and everybody else out into nature. I think we should celebrate that. He also was all about accessibility. When there was a debate about allowing cars into Yosemite, he came down on the side of let people come and enjoy nature. And so he wasn't exclusionary. Similarly on immigration, he wrote that the, 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 the state, the country should be open to everyone and that there should be space for everybody here. And Sierra Club has had an interesting history on that topic. He also understood the power of art in terms of changing people's views on nature. This is a picture from William Keith, a fellow Scot and his great friend. Um, he, Carlton Watkins, phot photographs of Yosemite. He understood, in a sense, the multimedia and the importance of emotion and reaching out to people. He also understood that, as much as we say he was this rigid preservationist in all of that, he understood that you had to make allies in the private sector and with political sector and things like that. In some ways, he probably leans a bit more towards Peter Kariva of the uh, Nature Conservancy than people would like to admit. But he really knew how to cajole and to play the, uh, play the angles on that. Now, we say then that he failed in his great fight the year before he died. Anyone know who this is? No, you don't. Good. William O'Shaughnessy. William O'Shaughnessy is the one who beat, in a sense, Muir for the O'Shaughnessy Dam and the damming of the Hetch Hetchy Valley. This is William O'Shaughnessy showing a map and it says San Francisco, X number acres of water for the city of the Hetch Hetchy Valley. No one knows who O'Shaughnessy is anymore. <laughs> Everybody knows who Muir is. He lost that battle, but in a sense, by showing us how to create an NGO like the um, Sierra Club, by showing us how to lobby and how to fight and how to try to stir up public reaction, even though he lost Hetch Hetchy, it's been argued that that was the model then for 20th century conservation and environmental activism. And that is a model that's not just um, uh, in the United States, but it's worldwide. This is a recent rally in Australia about protecting wilderness areas in Tasmania. And in a sense, I think that is part of Muir's legacy. I'm going to turn it over to John. We think of him as this crotchety, rigid old man. And he certainly had his faults. I'm not trying to, to, uh, to cover that up. But I would think we should think about what we need to take forward in the 21st century. Think about Muir as a young man who, at 33 years old, was sought out by 68, 69-year-old Ralph Waldo Emerson mm -hmm. to show him around Yosemite. A young man who could admire both as a gray, evolutionary biologist, great friend with Darwin, and Louis Agassiz, uh, geologist, father of the glacial theory, but a huge uh, critic of evolutionary theory. And then in that trinity, put in uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, of course, who probably thought both of those kinds of arguments were immaterial compared to the spiritual state of, of man. I think that if we take that open mind of how we define nature, how we look at nature, and that same open mind is how we look at Muir and his legacies, it will serve us well going forward. Okay. What's that? Leave that picture up. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We're So 
so um, I, 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 um, I, I guess I, you know, I mean, I could say I, I, I think the debate is over and I won. <laughs> <laughs> he's come, he, he's come, uh, he's come so far over to to uh, to uh, what I've been arguing and presented it so well <laughs> that it took took many of my arguments uh, right out of, right out of my mouth. But I am going to take my debate time and 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 and, and, and try to try to use it well. I think Glenn is 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 doing um, a marvelous job of rehabilitating John Muir um, and and um, and and uh, you know showing in new ways how we might think about him in, in ways that make him relevant. Um, you know when I um, when I argued uh, when we met uh, with a reporter from the LA Times and, and um, had a kind of debate a, around a table in, in Glenn's office and, and I argued that Muir is no longer relevant. And the reporter quoted me on that accurately. <laughs> and then I went on to say, uh, you know, in, in, in words that afterwards I, 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 I might have thought about rephrasing differently because they really did um, upset people. And, uh, you know, I, I, I understood that and I, I felt uh, uh, bad about that and, and, and apologized publicly for that, that, that um, because it, it was hurtful. Uh, when you know when I said it's uh, you know after a hundred years it's time to bury his legacy and move on um, and uh, you know I was quoted accurately um, and but um, but I think it was maybe you know it was it was uh, an intemperate thing to say um, and um, I was I was you know to a certain extent playing the devil's advocate um, in, in a debate, and it's something that we do all the time in academia, uh, and you know, and, and, and I, you know, and it's one of the great things about school, classrooms, whether it's you know the classrooms in your school or the classrooms in a in a graduate seminar um, in, in in the university, where you can test out ideas in a safe space, you know, where where you can say things that. You, you might not, you're still trying to work your way towards ideas. That you, you can say things that you maybe not, might not fully feel confident about, but you, you can debate them. Or you can take a really strongly held position and, and argue it. Um, and, you know, you can, you know, we can have an argument and it, it can be, you know, really intense argument about John Muir and his legacy and whether it's relevant anymore. And we can disagree strongly, and then we can, you know, walk out and, you know, go have a meal or a drink together and be friends and colleagues and, you know, and continue on. And that's a really valuable part of the academic and educational culture that, that we don't really, um, uh, we, we don't have in a, much of the rest of our society, um, and, and particularly, not, particularly not online, uh, you know, in the comment sections, um, you know, where, um, you know, where I was, uh, you know, I, I, I think I can, you know, I, I think I can say these things, you know, that where I was called a giant douchebag on Reddit, um, a, a jackass on Twitter, and then a guy called me on, on my phone that day and said, see, he and some of his friends had been talking and he just wanted me to know, it sounded like an elderly gentleman, he said that they were not going to let me destroy the planet. Oh. You know? so I was like, okay, good, I'm glad, you know. Um, but, you know, the, you can, I, I came, you know, I mean, I, I, I knew this, but I had, I don't think I had fully realized, you know, that, you know, as, as, as Glenn said, um, you know, the, there's a reason why we say there are places that are sacred, like Yosemite, or that John Muir is the patron saint of environmentalism. And when, you know, when you question those things that have that kind of sacredness to them, be careful. <laughs> uh, what, what I want to talk with you a little bit about, and here, here I want to get... Um, Get get a, a, a little bit academic, um, it, but it, you know is um, 
but I think it's something that's that's really important, and it's not it, you know it's not that uh, abstruse. Uh, I, I want to talk about the difference between heritage and history, and in a way in which heritage is also connected to how we think about legacy. So heritage and heritage institutions, um, you know, often like local community museums or cultural centers or um, uh, genealogical societies, uh, and, 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 and much of what, what we see around us often as a kind of public history is really about heritage. And that's the way in which we as um, communities or uh, groups or uh, uh, societies, the state, California, environmentalists, tell stories about ourselves and our history that make us feel good, that, that empower us to feel proud about our heritage, where we come from, where we're going, um, and, 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 and that's what we as historians think of as heritage, which is very different from history. History is, the way that we think about history is history is a discipline. And history, we sometimes say, is argument without end. It's always unfinished. There are always questions, new questions that we're asking about, about history, about the sources, about the context of you know, someone like John Muir, new information comes to light. We understand him in different ways. And history is complicated. And Glenn did a good job, I think, of complicating John Muir and his history for you. He, he, showed, a, he showed a lot of those um, complications of the man. John Muir was a complicated man. Um, he was not only a, a, a wilderness and, uh, you know, and, and nature advocate and advocate for parks. Um, he was a rancher and an orchardist in Martinez. He ran a big agribusiness. Uh, he became, by marrying into a family that had a big ranch and, and, and you know, uh, uh, an, an orchard um, in uh, Martinez, a wealthy man. Um, he hung out with uh, wealthy people. He was friends of in the industrialists and the railroad barons of his time. He convinced the railroad to build a station, a stop, on his, or on his ranch so that he could get goods to market uh, more efficiently. This is part of the complicated history of you know the history of the man, and I think it's an you know I think it's an important one to understand. And and I, although some people accuse me accuse me of many things, one of which they they accuse me of was you know tr wanting to forget that history. I'm a historian. Far be it from me to want to forget that history. I actually want to understand that complicated history, and I think Glenn's done a good job of of showing it. What I was arguing. And what I would still argue is that while history is complicated, heritage is often very, very simple. And often, sometimes anyway, counterproductive uh, for understanding the complications of our history and more importantly, our times. Um, I think the heritage or the legacy of John Muir that, that I find counterproductive, and Glenn has alluded to, to many of these things, is that the California that we set up, I mean, the, the California that Muir set up, uh, it, it is one of the cities where people, it's a tripartite California. It's one where people live in the cities. Um, he wasn't, you know, it, and, and, it is, it, and it's the, it's, this is the work, the vision that's sort of set out in, in, in John Muir's public writings, really. So that, you know, the cities that he wasn't very fond of, where people lived, um, the productive, the economically productive landscape of farms and ranches and mines, and then the cathedrals of nature. And, you know, we still live in that California, really. But it's changing, and I don't think that 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 
the way that that's set up as these kind of zones <coughs> of California divided you know, into these zones of California is very helpful for understanding our relationship with nature. We're increasingly seeing, of course, that there's nature across that spectrum. There's nature in the cities and the ways that we depend on clean water, clean air, uh, you know, th that, is, that is provided by nature, the parks and the biodiversity that we're increasingly discovering understanding in Los Angeles that the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles is very involved in, in studying and helping to connect people to. And I, you know, I've come from Northern California uh, uh, and, where, uh, you know, and I've only been here two years, but it always amazes me to come up to Topanga Canyon. And, you know, n not, not tonight when it took a little bit longer, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's only what, you know, half an hour away, I mean, at most, and just to see the way in which even in Los Angeles we think of, you know, the city is all imbricated with nature throughout it. We see the way in which nature is such an important part of farms and ranches, the ecosystem services, as we call them, that, that, that pollinators and others, you know, provide to, you know, to, to other aspects of nature provide to making the food that we depend on. Um, and, and, and then we also see that there's culture that runs across that spectrum too. That the wilderness, wilderness, the parks, even wilderness itself is a human creation. It's, it's a cultural creation. We, you know, people created the laws that protected and still protect and uh, administer and manage the, those areas. And so there's an important part of culture that runs across that spectrum too. And I don't think that Muir's way of thinking helps us really understand that in ways that, that, that help, uh, help us um, today. The other, you know, very fundamental, I, I think, kind of heritage and legacy of, of John Muir is this separation of people and nature. Uh, and, and, you know, I think um, it's, you know, similarly, we're really thinking about that in different ways. And as Glenn said, um, this model of, you know, the lone guy in the wilderness, you know, with the crust of bread, um, in his, you know, in his pocket, you know, climbing a tree in, in a windstorm and exulting in the power of nature. That's a wonderful, it's a wonderful image, but it's not, it's not the only way to relate to nature. Um, I want to just show you something, uh, you know, a couple of things. I think um, it's time for a new vision for parks and nature. And so I kind of want to run through, this is some, some things that I work on and it's part of what motivates me to uh, argue that I think we should, you know, there, there, there are new ways of thinking that we, that Muir doesn't really help us much with. Um, this, um, this is a picture of all of uh, the Instagram photos taken in parks around Los Angeles um, last year. And it's, it's a heat map, so the red areas are <coughs> where there are more Instagram photos um, created. And the way that we created this visualization and harvested them was we actually took the photos that have the ge geographic location on them, the latitude and longitude, and then, and then mapped them. And it's a part of a project that we've been doing on, on parks where we, uh, my colleagues at Stamen Design in, in um, San Francisco, we worked together on this research project, looking at all the social media that emanates from parks, Instagram, Flickr, Twitter, and Foursquare um, check-ins. And we ranked the parks by their, um, uh, uh, by the, um, um, their sort of popularity on, on, on so social media. And here, here's, and then we displayed that um, in, on this um, website. And what we discovered is that, uh, it, you know, it, you you sh you showed that in some ways. I mean, Muir also had this, but in contrast to you know the image of the lone guy in the wilderness, parks are social. 
people do all kinds of things in parks that they do the, in the, the rest of their lives. They, um, you know, they, 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 take, they take selfies, they share them, they take pictures of their friends, they take pictures of their landscape, they comment on it, and sometimes they share too much information, particularly on Twitter. <laughs> um, but, um, we've, so we found that, that parks are social, and um, that's a really powerful that's a really powerful thing to to um, think about. So so and it, as we think about the need to create and to engage new constituencies in parks, if parks are social, we don't have to gin that up. We don't have to create that. It's already there. It's already happening. And I told this story to a deputy director of the National Park Service when I was back in Washington D.C. in the fall, and she and and she said, "Yeah, yeah, it's like they're it's like these people are having a party over here, and they're talking about us, and we're not going to the party." So the parks, as you as Glenn pointed out, you know, are still trapped in this old way of thinking although they know there's this new conversation and this new party going on. And so they, they need to figure out how to, be, uh, how to be part of it. Because parks, the National Park Service, which is celebrating its 100th anniversary next year, uh, state parks in California, uh, conservation organizations like the Nature Conservancy and others, real, they, they look at these demographics and they realize that they're in danger of losing a whole generation of people. And those are, you know, your students and students, my students in college now. Um, and, and if they don't have that, if that generation doesn't come up as people engaged and supportive of parks and of conservation, we're really in big trouble. But this shows that in many ways they are real, they are engaged, they're talking, they're participating. So how do we participate in that? The other thing that this shows is one of the barriers that the Parks Forward Commission in um, California has identified to people going, diverse Californians going to parks is that they don't think that they will see people like themselves in parks. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, you know, it's less likely they will than in the rest of the population, but I also think that's a legacy of John Muir. That's a legacy of the idea of the way that you you know, the way that you go to nature and parks, and people have told me this, is like, why are you doing this stuff on social, about social media? You're supposed to leave that stuff behind. You're supposed to go alone into nature. That's the way to do it. Um, it's one way to do it. Uh, it's, not the on, it's not the only way. And what social media shows is that um, people, diverse Californians will see people like themselves in parks. And if you can show that, it's an invitation. Um, you know the other, the other, uh, the other um, aspect of, of this. We're work the, the Yosemite. There's some of the Twitter. You know, uh, we've worked with uh, our colleagues in, in groups like Outdoor um, Afro, uh, which is trying to change that image, and Latino Outdoors. Um, and what we also know about this new generation um, is that, and, and this comes from something that John Jarvis, the, the head of the National Park Service, uh, once uh, said uh, in a, a, a hearing here in California of the, of the Parks Forward Commission that is looking at how to reinvigorate state parks. He said they found that this new millennial generation that they're really concerned about losing um, that they don't like to be spoon-fed information. They like to discover things. Their way of learning and engaging is discovery, and I think that resonates with some of the work that you're doing at the school um, and, and your, you know, your approach there. And, and John Jarvis said, and we've been spoon-feeding people information for 100 years. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard for us to change this. And I think it's part of this, again, part of this legacy of John Muir that there's, there's this one sacred way of relating to nature. Um, and if it, people don't do it that way, it must be because they, they don't care or something. And I think if we ask people whether they care, whether they have a relationship with nature, we will find that all people do. And that the thing that we need to do now is to ask the question 
and listen. You know, so with um, we're working uh, to develop an app um, that is going to launch. Uh, you're among some of the first people publicly to hear about it uh, in a couple of weeks called CaliParks.org, um, which will be a way to discover um, uh, parks near where you are, where you're going to be today, where you can do things. It's based on the user experience and the user um, discovery of that that's going to be part of a bigger effort to build uh, a constituency and engagement in the future among this very diverse, millennial, technologically savvy, socially engaged um, generation um, for for, for parks. And I would just like leave you with, because I also like to think not just about our own backyard in California, but about the, about the global um, significance of it. This is a map of the world of 7 billion people. We know that the population is probably you know, going to increase to 9 or 10 billion over this century. Most of that growth is going to end up in cities. That means that cities are going to double and I'm sorry, this is really small, so you can't see it, but I'll describe what it is. Most of, that, most of that population is going to end up in cities, all of it effectively, so that the urban population on Earth is going to double in the next 40 years in the times that some of, a great deal of the Saudis will still be alive to see that. Um, and... and um, because that popu urban population is going to double, that actually means that the built, urban built environment is going to double. Um, and how that happens is really fundamentally going to determine how we live with each other, how people live with each other, and how people live with nature on Earth. What we see when we look at these trends is, yes, there are big impacts of that, but this is also, um, and this was from National Ge Geographic, um, a... Uh, an, in, an increasingly an increasingly literate population and, incre and an increasingly connected um, population. And so there are all kinds of opportunities for education, for storytelling, for communicating in a world in which people are, you know, are, 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 are very connected. And I think those are the kinds of things that we need to think about as we think about the future of our relationship with nature here in Topanga Canyon or the LA area in California, in the United States or in the world. Thanks. So we're going to um, have a short discussion. I have a lot of uh, points to dig into, but I'll keep it brief. And then we'll open it up to everyone for uh, any questions you may have. Um, one thing I really wanted to talk about, or at least kind of put into perspective, is this idea of um, role model. I think a lot of what we're <coughs> talking about is John Muir as a role model, and to what extent he is or isn't. Um, John actually wrote a very eloquent um, follow-up to the LA Times article, and I just wanted to quote something you had written. John Muir was a terrific hero for the 19th and 20th centuries, and he accomplished amazing things in his own life and in the work he has inspired. But while we might take inspiration from Muir as a founder of the environmental movement, we can't count on him for guidance now any more than we can turn back, turn back to George Washington as a guide to politics today. Um, so I wonder, you bring up the term hero, um, and in thinking about it in this perspective, do you think that there's something, are we missing a particular person today? Are we missing a leader? I, I think, th 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 yes, but it might not be the time for that kind of leader or hero anymore. Um, that, uh, you know, and I think that, you know, there, that, I mean, thinking historically, uh, you know, John Muir was very much a man of his times, and it, it, what, there, there were possibilities uh, for that kind of uh, writing to, you know, have real prominence um, and salience, you know, among, 
you know, a, a particular, uh, particularly among the elite in, in, in America, um, the, you know, and, and I, you know, that's just really much, much harder and maybe impossible to do in the kind of cacophonous, diverse world that we live in. So we might really need new ways of uh, thinking about what, um, what leadership means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that you brought up social media too, and the ways that people are interacting with parks in different ways. Um, did you have any thoughts, Glenn? Well, I, I, I do want to come back to the, are we looking for the one great leader? And I think that in many ways that time has passed. I mean, think about this for people of my age. You know, you would eagerly await the next album by, let's say, the Beatles or something. And everybody would know that music. And that would dominate and they would be the trendsetters and leaders. Look at in music today. Everybody listens to something different. People have a fairly short self-life. There's such diversity, in part because we can now stream it, we can download it. It's such a wide playing field, such a huge palette. And I think that's true with thought also. So I think the John Mears today are found in the leadership of Outdoor Afro, for instance, and, and some of the, uh, the Latino movements. And, and in, 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 in places like the Sierra Club, where it's individuals trying to make a difference, I'm not sure that they'll ever have that same platform anymore, because everything has become distributed, right? And, but if we have enough people in these distributed areas that are trying to do good, that then will achieve something. I think it, it does have to do also with that notion of, uh, you know, people, uh, people don't, I think, you know, people don't want to be spoon fed information. Um, and, and, um, and, and, and I think that, you know, there were, there were, there were possibilities, you know, for a John Muir or others to, to really kind of speak for um, people uh, and, uh, and and that's much more difficult, and maybe that's good in an era in which people want to participate in conversations. They want to be heard. They don't want to be lectured to. <laughs> and, you know. I wonder. We talked um, in October. We had um, a man named John, John Young come and speak, and part of what he talked about was the uh, low uh, membership of organizations like the Sierra Club and the Audubon Society. I wonder what you think the future of organizations like that are. I mean, is everything changing in the sense that people are going to be more engaged in social media rather than being part of the actual organization? Well, the, all those are, and, and I think that was, you know, part of the trouble that I ran into was people interpreted what I said, you know, when I say John Muir may no longer be relevant to saying that the Sierra Club is no longer relevant. And I didn't say that. And I know that, and, and I've, you know, I, I, I knew beforehand, and now I really know because they, you know, <laughs> they, they told me, you have to come talk to us. And I went to San Francisco and spent a couple hours talking with, you know, them and learned much more about what they're doing. And I, I you know, I had known much of that already. They're doing a heck of a lot to try and reinvent themselves, to try and figure out how to engage, you know, with uh, diverse Californians, diverse Americans. That you know, and, and part of that is they're desperate to figure out how to connect, you know, how to matter. And and I think they're doing I think they're doing a really great job. And it's also causing them to rethink their relationship to communities and not come in to communities and say, we have the answers. You know, and we need your. You know, we need you to get in line and help us. You know, uh, you know, stop this development or put in. You know, this protected area. But um, but they're going into communities and and you know, asking what's important in those communities. Mm -hmm. And sure, coming in with their basic you know environmental goals and values, but understanding that they gotta meet halfway and listen. So you know, I, I, you know, there's a lot of really good, important work, you know, happening in in, in the environmental uh, organizations, uh, as well as in the National Park Service and in California state parks to figure this out. Yeah, I would agree. I think that they really are making a very genuine effort, and they're making a genuine effort to reach into the cities and and to redefine nature, including the Sierra Club. Absolutely true. 
I think when you stand back, there is a larger context here, and and that is this fact that people don't want to be spoon fed. There's many different ideas; they all want to be heard, right? And I think that the dynamics which brings people together in these organizations that have a hierarchy are changing in this country. And I'll give you two examples. The Occupy Movement. Occupy Movement got a lot of attention, a lot of excitement, but it, and, and there was no end game. There was no focus, there was no leadership, and no one's occupying anything anymore. <laughs> and on the other end of this political spectrum, the Tea Party. You know, the Tea Party was you know, formed, but it, it eschewed and any kind of hierarchy. And, and it was almost like you were an individual, and that's what defined you as a Tea Party member or you're a libertarian or something. And again, its, its sway has kind of collapsed. And so I do wonder if there isn't a larger context with, with the grappling with organizations in, in a, a landscape where there's so many voices can now be heard and want to be heard. And, uh, and, and so I do, I do wonder if there's, there's other deeper things than just the environmental uh, club membership. It's a lot of clubs, a lot of organizations that are losing members. And so I think this is broader. Uh, one of the big focuses of our school is uh, nature connection and making sure that nature is a part of what we're doing, that there's a conscious uh, connection to nature. Um, I wonder, in the past hundred years, um, in the course of John Muir's legacy, do you think that people have become more out of touch with nature? Um, if so, how do we get back in touch? So I, um, I, I, I think that I think that there uh, are reasons um, for concern. Um, and and I, I, I think the things like you're doing at the school are, are, are really great. Um, and um, where I, you know, what, what my, my concern with it though is that, is that we often measure, um, are you, you know, are people connected to nature a lot of those studies that say people are less connected to nature are looking at things like membership in these organizations or visiting national parks or uh, fishing licenses or hunting licenses. And I'm not sure that those are the only ways to measure people's connections to nature. You know, what about gardens in the city or, you know, pets even? I, you know, I, you, I talk with a lot of, you know, people who, you know, have have very deep connections to nature through animals um, or, you know, through gardening. Um, and, and I think, you know, we do know that having a connection to nature and having nature in your life is really important. You know, there's enough studies of that for like health, for cognitive, you know, abilities, for, you know, feeling good about the world. But we also we also know that if you you know and I you know it might be a little sacrilegious here like is if you don't you know if you can't get out into nature, being able to see nature from a window is pretty darn good, you know and even being able to see nature on a TV screen can do part of it, you know those are uh, it, it, I see I you're, I know you're shaking your head but there have been studies that have you know there have been studies that, that have looked at this and so I kind of I'm a little bit like I think. We should we should really think capaciously about all the ways to um, you know think about to interact with nature. So a friend of mine had has a daughter um, who and he was taking her he was going to take her to the aquarium in um, uh, San Francisco and sh she wanted to bring her iPad and he was like no no don't bring the iPad we're going to see nature you know leave it home and she insisted you know and they went to the aquarium. And she went through with the she went through with the iPad, taking pictures, taking notes, and like by the time they were done and they got home, she had posted like a story about their trip to the aquarium, was sharing it with friends. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So to wrap up, John Muir. Um, I'm curious, we've talked about a lot of, you know, benefits and the maybe not so great aspects of his legacy. 
um, as the John Muir Memorial Chair of Geography. Um, what is his relevance today? Well, um, <coughs> first off, of course, there's just physical things that he left us, the national parks that he left us, and, and uh, in a sense, a, an organization which is evolving, the National Park Service, which, which could do good things in the future and has great people who are well aware. I mean, the, the numbers I'm quoting, a lot of them come from studies the National Park Service has done. So he left us a, a, a physical heritage. Also would say, as, as the reaction to John's uh, quotes in the article showed, for a lot of people, he's still a very strong emotional um, motivator for people to care about nature, to care about the wilderness. And I think some of the reaction was because people felt that we were dismissing them. We were dismissing their deep felt care about nature, about what they've put into it. And I think that would be wrong. And I think that we have to have a tent that's big enough for those people that, that were motivated and love him, um, that, that, that that's okay, you know? And, and that I don't think that the intention ever was to sort of say, well, you guys don't matter anymore. And you know, I, I've gotten that in some of my own writings when I talked about the importance of opening up to the city or opening up to people of color and things like that. It's not saying that people that look like me don't matter or people that really love his writing don't, don't matter. It's just to, to open it up. So, so I, I, think, I think it's there. I think the other thing that I find really interesting is Muir was a contradictory person. He had a lot of contradictions. Mm -hmm. And frankly, the, being an environmentalist today, if you're realistic, it's a world full of contradictions and compromise. Mm -hmm. And I think studying him and getting deeper into that is really interesting territory. And I'm not sure he he ever was able to balance those contradictions. I'm not even sure he tried to. But we have to grasp with exactly the same sets of contradictions today. And I think that in the low-hanging fruit, most of it's gone. We're going to be in a world of contradiction and compromise. And kind of thinking about how, how he dealt with that is, to me, really interesting. And it shows that you know, uh, the more things change, the more, in a sense, they stay the same. Thank you. Uh, so I want to open it up to questions. Liam. Uh, so uh, did, uh, what's his name? John Muir. Muir. John Muir. Did he um, ever, like, uh, culturally change the world? Did, his, did he change the world? Yeah, like culturally. culturally. Like in culturally. In people's culture, did it change them or no? Well, I mean, I, I think you know. I, it's a good I, 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 yeah, no, it's a. I mean, it's a great question, and and I think the most, you know, the most really powerful um, kind of um, change that it, it, you know, we can't just say that John Muir did it as a historian. I would because he was a man of his times, and there were others, you know, like Ralph Waldo Emerson and 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 and, and many others, you know, who. Um, were part of the development of a kind of idea of America as uh, nature's nation. You know, that's often used by historians. That what really makes America special is are these great open spaces, this wild land, these national parks, these places like Yosemite and Yellowstone, and all the art, the photography and painting that went along with that. And some of the most amazing images of, 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 you know, that uh, some of which Glenn showed of, of you know, big nature in, in, in America, you know, came out of photography and painting and the writings of, of, of John Muir. And so I think, you know, one of, he helped shape that, that idea in our culture that nature is, and, and big nature, big wild places are part of our you know, are part of who we are, are part of our, are part of our soul, um, and and so, you know, and that that is that that's that's sacred, in a way, and so that's very cultural, right? The idea that nature is sacred is a really strong cultural idea, and John Muir had a big part of that. Yeah. 
So in some of John Muir's writings, he talks about uh, traveling for days, and he's got a loaf of bread, some tea, a cooking pot, and a blanket. So what that tells me is that he is foraging, he's building fires, he is uh, very deeply understanding and connected and invested in the land. What I see in California today is that there are many people who are visiting the parks that see it as an interesting backdrop to their own human social dynamics. And I, I question whether these people really deeply care whether we have spotted owls or marbled murrelets or whether we have a, a really fully functioning natural system. It's just a, a, a nice open space for them to get together and do whatever it is that they do socially. Um, <clears throat> for me, that's really deeply concerning. And I'm, I'm, I don't know that usage of national parks is a good measure of our society's investment in a healthy natural system. And I, I'm wondering if you, either one of you care to speak about that. I'm going to tackle it head on. And I'm going to say as, fo as follow. Um, Speaking to the writer of the LA Times article, this is this Hispanic guy, we talked about the San Gabriel Mountains and the fact that f for a lot of Latino families, they love to go there for exactly that reason. They love to put their feet in the water, they like to have a picnic there. They're not botanizing necessarily or bird watching or anything else, but they really love it. They're really enjoying it. And then if you look at the polling for support for the San Gabriel uh, wilderness area. It's about 88% Hispanics are supported it and were behind it. Mm -hmm. Now, what they're drawing out of that landscape is maybe different than you and I would draw out of it. I'm not sure I'm going to be in a position to diminish that, th what, what they're drawing out of. And I'm delighted that they are part of the, the group who supports us creating that wilderness area that we can all enjoy. Um, and uh, the other point is this. Remember I said there was some feeling that National Park Service was unfriendly to people of color. Well, th that, was, that was told to me by this guy. That he was saying, you know, he has colleagues who, th who think that that's inappropriate for them to go have a big family picnic out there and just kind of just go out and hang out and all that stuff. And he said that they found that, he found that deeply offensive. And that put a barrier between um, their wanting to be there. They're feeling unwelcome, right? And so finally, Muir confronted this. Muir wrote to Mrs. Carr in a letter about people coming into Yosemite and, quote, not getting it. They came to hang out to look. This is back in the day, right? You know, they come and look at it. It's kind of like the Grand Tour, but they didn't quite get it. And at the end of the day, he basically said, yeah, okay, it frustrated him, but it's just the way it was. And it's, it's actually not doing any harm. It's probably doing, doing good. So I, I get what you... I think that greater, deeper involvement is, fan, is fantastic. And obviously that motivates me. But I think people take different things out of nature. I would myself never try to free climb El Capitan, okay? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And, and I would resist if someone said to me, the only way you can enjoy Yosemite is if you're going to free climb El Capitan. I'm delighted that people can do that. I'm, I'm, I'm respectful and in awe of it. Mm -hmm. But I think that as long as we're not doing harm and people can come out and enjoy it, you know, some of them are going to get deeper into it. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? Exposure itself, that's my thought. Yeah, it, I mean, you know, Glenn's right not only about the San Gabriel Mountains, mm -hmm. but about most of the environmental uh, measures and bonds that have been passed in California in the last 10 years have been heavily, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's been due to the disproportionate support for them among Latino voters. And so that's a really important thing um, to realize. I, the, I think the, the other thing that I would say um, is that you know you gotta you gotta meet people where they are, and then there's an opportunity, you know, to to you know to go to the other kinds of questions like you know important questions that you're asking, 
um, and 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 I think that that you know that's also kind of the model for the engagement of a new you know younger generation. It may be that they're not joining the Sierra Club or becoming members of the Natural History Museum. Um, you know and and you know so the Natural History Museum is doing First Fridays you know, where they open up the museum on the first Friday of every month and they have DJs and they have food trucks and they have a bar and they have science talks, you know. And so you don't immediately ask people to like become, you know, John Muir or Glenn McDonald or John Christmas or <laughs> E.O. Wilson or something, but you know, you, 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 um, you, or to become a member, you figure out ways to have that conversation in new ways and engage and make people feel included and then you can begin that journey of engagement. Mm -hmm. Just just as a follow up on that though, what about the wilderness paths? I mean, has that really affected the I mean I feel that personal frustration of you go up to Ohio and you go up thirty three or something, you can't park anywhere because you forgot your path. Right, and, and so there's this thing where, where it's like monetized it in such a way you can't, like, you know, Latino families. It's almost like it keeps Latino families out, right? Yeah, and and I think you know the the so the state parks anyway is really thinking you know the, and the Parks Forward Commission, mm -hmm. which in a couple of weeks when we launch this app is also when they're going to release their final recommendations for rethinking a lot about things like this about state parks and I think the national parks you know will be doing similar um, it, it is and, and, and using technology for that I mean so like if you get you know if you get up there why can't you pay with a credit card or, <laughs> or with your phone even or something I mean there's ways of there, there's <laughs> ways of like lowering there's ways of lowering the barriers of engagement yeah. and making fee people feel like they're welcome and included mm -hmm. and we really got to begin using all of those ways and you know point and figuring out what are the perceived and actual barriers mm -hmm. Uh, because I think you know people want people want to be in, they want to have a connection with nature. So this is all well and good, but financially, the money that our state parks take in is basically cut in half in Sacramento. So what? Where's the shift on getting money back to the parks? Because if you're going to try to in get these people in there. You know, McGrath has been closed off and on. You know, there's one ranger that does five mm -hmm. parks on Saturday night before I stop going to the park. Yeah, and, what? and why is it that every time that there's a any kind of budget discussion, the first thing that they're going to put on the block is, this, is the park? Right. Well, so I, I just like I would encourage you to like watch. <laughs> I know you're doing no, it. No, I, I know you're doing, yeah, it, but like watch, watch mm -hmm. over the next couple of weeks. Okay, there's going to be a new organization created to to try to put positive pressure on on uh, the uh, California government and state parks at a time when there is real um, and, and and very. I think yeah, I've I've looked very carefully at you know these these things. I think there's real possibilities for reform on the kinds of uh, the questions, you know, and concerns that, yeah. that, that you all are raising, um, and and a lot of that's going to roll out over the next couple of couple of weeks. The key, I think, the key, I think, is um, you know, state parks went through a crisis. You're alluding your yeah. parks were shut down, money was misspent and hidden. It and was misspent because they actually the parks were making money. But the government took half. I, 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 I mean, I understand, you know, I understand and I get, you know, and, okay. and I get all of your saying, and I think one of the basic, you know, one of the basic things that needs to happen is that the parks, the state government and the parks need to show that there's real change and needs to reestablish trust uh, with the, you know, with Californians. Or we're not, or we're not going to have the support that's needed yeah. to, to, you know, to, to do that. And so, so, what's the organization? Are you sworn to secrecy? Uh, it, it, it's, it, I, I should let, I should let it, 
let it roll out before I announce it here. <laughs> you know, but you'll your secret safe. You'll see yeah. it. You know. <laughs> no, <laughs> <up on> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's actually um, reflecting on everything that's been shared. I uh, and uh, going through a couple areas. One, when you mentioned earlier, the person who are we looking for a leader? Who somebody um, that's going to step up and, and do everything for us? Um, the feelings that I get is that each and every one of us here, you, me, you, 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 me, myself, we're all that person that we're looking up to. So when we get up and we look in the mirror, that's the person that we need to be looking at as a leader. And the word, when I think of community, I think of the word actually common unity. So when you, what do we all have in common? And we're all unified here, and we all want our to share this land, the parks, and the recreation, and so forth. And then I think of, I really um, <coughs> feel when you said when yeah, you go up and you can't park or you can't use it or another class of people may say, no, we don't like it because so-and-so. But we all have a, a common interest and the land really belongs to us. And I think taking that responsibility, I, what I find the most offensive is that we continually give our power away to government. And the government has abused their power and taken the money from the people and used it for their own self-interest. But I think that time has come where now we all have to really reflect and say, how much am I giving away? And what are they really doing for me? It's up to us to now care for our land, our parks, and so forth. And you have mentioned something about um, the money being able to take care or the park being closed. Well, why? If there's so many people in certain groups. Why aren't they taking the initiative, or we, that individual, taking that initiative to handle that area? Or to come together in community to take care of those parks. That happened a lot um, when you know when there when the, the state threatened to shut down seventy parks. Uh, community organizations around the state sprung up to support those parks and kept sixty nine of them open. You know, and so I think you're I think you're absolutely right that that's essential. It's been part of what's been essential about trying to drive this rethinking of uh, state parks. You know, I think that there's positive direction in that, and that it's going to need the support of you know organizations and people and groups you know around the state, um, and that and that we'll see that happen. I think one you've you've put your finger these three you know comments that put your finger on you know um, uh, you know something something of a big difference between our times and, and John Muir's times you know that that um, and I it's very concerning to me you know that I think we don't believe or you know people don't believe that that government can be part an important part of the solution no. and that it should and, and you know and that we can as you know, citizens or voters that make that government representative of our interests, and and I think I think we you know we have this, you know I, I think there's an un, kind of an unfortunate result of that that we do have the idea that we all need to solve this individually, and I don't think it's going to I don't think the big things that are going to be very important like figuring out a future for our state park system. They're not going to happen without government. So we need to figure out how to make government work for us. Um, and, you know, and I think at the time, whether you were on John Muir's side or on the opposite side in the debate over you know, uh, Yosemite and Hetch Hetchy, both sides in that debate believed that government could solve this challenge. Or, or better serve it. Yeah. And it was part of that ideology of what became known as the progressive era, that government, good government, was a big part of the solution for our society. I, I, think, it would, I think it would be great if we could revive some of that. Yeah. You know, it's a long, here, hard here, 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 you know, but it's going to be a lot of work. Yeah, um, well, thank you guys very much for coming and sharing your backgrounds and your expertise and your passions. Um, I was just thinking about a few things that were mentioned and including what my, my colleague and friend Chris was talking about with respect to what John Muir was doing out there uh, when he was by himself and whether that needs to happen by yourself or not, I think isn't what, isn't what I'm going at. But <clears throat> you mentioned something about you know this kid who went to 
to the, I guess it was the aquarium, or somewhere with the dad. It was about, dad wanted this nature experience, leave the technology behind, let's get out there and do, and, and the kid ended up, you know, blogging or writing or Instagramming or, you know, and created something of value that was connected to, and I, and I do agree you can get nature connected looking at these plants that are potted here. One of the things we're really committed to at Manzanita School is, is actually, and Liam's so sweet over here, he wrote, cultural change and he drew the logo and and I'm not I don't know where he got that because that's not something I I think he's been you guys are talking about cultural change well part of what and you mentioned I think Edward Wilson and, and and it's the quality of attention that I think it starts there and so I think the father wanting the kid to leave the technology behind is a little bit driven by this sense that recreation in nature is one level of engagement and it's very important and it's very meaningful and it's led a lot of people to give money to the parks. I think what we're facing in the 21st century is a, is a crisis of magnitude that if that's, that's about some of the values that we hold and some of the ideas. And I think it, I, I, I think what Chris was getting at, Chris Morosky, is that um, when we do leave behind some of the distraction, we can go into a quality and level of depth mm -hmm. with this living, vibrating earth that we are actually born out of that reawakens our deep commitment to steward this earth. Mm -hmm. And so the ecological unconscious, maybe it, it pulls from there in some way. But I, I think that's, that's a level of conversation and commitment that I think we have to be willing to engage. So not to minimize this incredibly valuable idea that let's harness technology to maybe begin to pull us back in in a way that's going to have relevance to kids. But also, let, let's also remind ourselves that there's a quality of attention that's, that needs to be called forth that um, might require us to turn it off and to, to study and listen and engage on a level that will bring back a kind of stewardship that's um, maybe, maybe overdue. <laughs> but, uh, and I think John Muir uh, and many others like him still are role models in the sense that they, they really went out with, with, a, with an intention to come back passionate advocates for conservancy, I don't know that I fully agree with the pristine wilderness piece because I'm more of a, of a, of a tending the earth kind of relation, like Cat Anderson kind of. But we're really supposed to be. And I love that you said, and I'll stop with this. But the city, the parks in the city, the rural areas that were growing food, and the wilderness, they can't be compartmentalized separate entities. They're all the interface between the human and the and the earth. And we have to be able to traverse those on some common trails, right? Mm -hmm. That that return us to a healthier dynamic. So anyway. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> no, it is, it, I, you know, and, and I, you know, I think it's, it's, it's one of those, you know, signs of the times that, you know, sometimes when you, you know, I actually, I put it, I put it away in my backpack so I wouldn't, it wouldn't be buzzing here. You know, it's like when, when you don't have any signal, it's like, oh, phew. You know, it's like, again, you know, and, and, or, you know, I was hiking with my, you know, but I, th I think it, it's not always like clear, you know, who's going to make this, you know, connection or this demand. You know, so I was hiking. You know, my my uh, younger daughter goes to Middlebury, which is a very kind of you know eco. There's a lot of she's be, she's very outdoorsy and 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 goes hiking and stuff. And so my older daughter and I went to visit her parents' weekend, and she took us on a hike. And you know, both my older daughter and I were like checking my phone, you know, so I was like texting with my partner back here in LA and she was doing it and my younger daughter was like, put those away, you know, <laughs> just like, just give them to me, I'm putting them in my backpack, you can't check them, <laughs> you know, so, no, I don't, I don't, I don't disagree, you know, I think we, I think we can do both, so I don't think it, you know, I don't think it's one or the other, but I think you're, I, you know, I think it's really important to ask the question that you're asking and to, and to, you know, have these times of disconnecting. And I say it because I watch these students. We have 37 students, right, ages 9 to 6, 15, almost 16. And we don't have cell service up there. Um, it just happens to be up in Old Canyon. Um, but, but what I really want to say was that I'm watching this experience of kids like, like, like mycelium, like they're rooting down into the earth on a level that I can't even articulate. And I'm one that's, you know, I talk a lot. But... I see this happening to them, and they're coming back saying things to us, because we do a lot of sort of processing what their experiences are on the land, and we're not just walking out there, we're, we're doing a whole set of nature connection practices, including 
tracking and wandering and primitive skills and things that awaken kind of DNA in us. And I'm really intrigued with the quality of their connection, okay? And I, I think it can be quantified and I think it should be studied and understood because it's not like anything that I've seen and they're out there 40 to 50% of the time, they're on the land and it's a beautiful piece of wild chaparral and it's connected to MRCA land and, um, and it's endless. I mean, it's an endless, and with this rain that we got, talk about biodiversity, you know, the Santa Monica's are notorious, and this canyon in particular, and without even knowing, you feel the biodiversity as it's growing up out of the rainy soil, and, and I, I wish I could quantify it, because it's fascinating, and these kids, like, they, they are exceeding our expectations, and our, almost our ability to teach them, mm -hmm. because they're so facile with this intuitive place that kind of gets rinsed away by academia and myself, you know. I, I well, there's lots of, I mean, there's, there's lots of good studies that, you know, have, that are quantifying that, that are corroborating it, at, you know. At, Do you mean like I, all the Richard Lou stuff, or? Well, I mean, no, I mean, the, 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 the some of, the, uh, yeah, I, I. I'll have to get some. Some of the things list. that, a lot of the things that Richard Lou cites and has built his argument upon, and that continue, you know, and that, and that continue to study and ex ex explore things like this. this is where I was saying, you know, that, like, you, you know, I, I think it's fairly well proven from my perspective, you know, that nature is good <laughs> for people. And that, you know, and, and, and unfortunately, though, it's not, it, you know, it's not evenly distributed. Um, and, and, and that, you know, there are communities in Los Angeles that don't have access to nature, even a tree outside the window. And, 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 and many of those communities, you know, we, I've done some, you know, studies of the distribution of nature around cities in America, including in Los Angeles. And I think it's clear from looking that, at that, I mean, to return to the other theme, you know, that n those communities are not likely to get nature without some kind of government help mm -hmm. intervention some policy mm -hmm. and again you know where we need, I think you know it's not it's it's just not going to be a solution that can be an individual solution so I, I think it's important that we recognize that you know nature is not only good for people it's also a public good mm -hmm. that we need to think about yeah. you know that, that's so well established that I think it's it is a matter of health well-being. Yeah, and thank you for bringing that piece in because it's easy to be up here in a privileged place and talk about it on this level. And, and what you're saying is very critical. Mm -hmm. If we need an affirmative action for, that's not a dirty word, but like Caltrans selectively landscapes in wealthier neighborhoods in different ways on the freeways than they do. I mean, it's, it's, it's really it's interesting, mm -hmm. bizarre. I mean. mm -hmm. no, I'd just like to say that I, I think that 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 experience that you talked about, one that getting that deeper involvement with nature, it's what, what you were talking about. And I think that's really important. And I also think having those times where all is quiet, in other words, there is nothing distracting you, and you start to contemplate, you know, that's really important too. And I just, I'd like people to have that opportunity, you know, and I think sometimes, um, that will come about when they go there with their friends and they're not even thinking about it, but all of a sudden that moment hits, they get deeper. Mm -hmm. That's the thing, and that's why I think we, we probably shouldn't sort of privilege certain activities over others. I think you know, nature does have a kind of way when you get out there, it does have a way of embracing you, you know, if you, if you just have the opportunity. And I really do agree with John, there's just too many kids that don't have the opportunity. And it's really funny to me too, it's not just you know, I teach a second or a freshman course in at UCLA on biogeography. This has about 130 students in it. You would just be shocked. These are students who got into UCLA. They're, you know, you would be shocked how little experience they have with the mountains of California, with the deserts, with you know what's growing between here and and the beach. I really, really am just. I'm, I'm, I'm profoundly shocked by it. Why is that, you think? I, you know, I think, um, there's, I think there's a number of reasons of it. One is that we live in a huge, like ge geographically, a huge embracing 
urban, suburban, um, you know, extra urban space, right? And there's a lot to do there. I think a lot of it is that they drive through these landscapes, but they don't stop at them and they don't contemplate them. I think part of it is that a lot of the kids that get into UCLA are maybe first or second generation immigrant families, that the, um, the uh, things that were important were, were different. You know, it was getting yourself established, mm -hmm. keeping your family together, getting an education, all of that. And so the, the kind of things that my parents made a point of taking us out to parks and we visited Yosemite and all of that, that may not be the huge priority. Do you know what I mean? Either for lack of resources or it's just not part of the, of the culture. But it really is really interesting to me to see how my career as a teacher, um, if I talk about Big Bear or I ask, you know, see how few kids have actually gone mm -hmm. and just and done that sort of thing. You know, really, really is surprising. And this is an elite school. A lot of the kids are, you know, they maybe not super affluent, but they're certainly not not poverty. So I, the, other, the other thing I teach in addition to history is, is communications and so I'm teaching a course on environmental communications and I have 50 students and I've divided them into four projects that they'll work on developing a communication strategy around water, around parks, around climate, and around backyard habitat. Um, and, and, um, and, and, and my charge to them is to like help me figure out how to communicate with and engage your generation because like I don't have I don't have the answers I mean I want to I want to listen to you you know help me help me figure this out um, and and one of the one of the students who got most you know is sort of like most passionate about this parks project she said I wasn't raised like outdoors you know is this a kid like you're talking about it was like we never went you know to these places but like I want to do this you know I want to get engaged I want to get other kids you know students my age I really want to figure this out because it's really important so you know that engagement can happen in different ways and at different times in life and, and they you got know, a lot more homework yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot more extracurricular stuff they don't they're not outside a lot anymore especially the kids with the 4.2s going to UCLA They've had, to, they've had to compromise a lot of leisure time to get there too. I think that's a big yeah. obstacle. It's about time to wrap up, but I want to um, go to one more question mm -hmm. in the back. Um, yeah, I just want to comment on the cultural piece. And in traditional Native American cultures, you would have, people would be finding themselves as, say, a keeper of a stream or the uh, the steward of a of a sacred site on a mountain, and even whole groups would find themselves as uh, keepers of certain uh, aspects of the landscape. And um, as a keeper, that required you to go and sing, say, to the stream, to the to the spring, to keep it healthy. And you'd listen. Also, you'd listen to see what's out of balance in the stream because what's out of balance in the stream is out of balance in the culture and in your people. So you listen for that. And I think this kind of deep listening that you're talking about and giving, helping people have those experiences, those deep experiences which nature will give us when we can get quiet and when we can get more. The culture that teaches us that's not important. Um, so I do see it as a deep cultural shift that's required, and it is a spiritual shift, I see. And that, and that it will happen. The earth will help us get there in one way or another. And, um, but I'm just thankful that everybody's talking about it. And, and also the access thing. My, my friend is, a, he is one of the keepers of Yellowstone. And he talks about not being able to get there, get in there to do ceremony when they need to. So that, that for the people who are controlling the parks, it's important for them to understand these cultural uh, yeah. things. So that's a big, that's another really important part of the recommendations for reform of state parks. Um, and there's a Native American, you know, very strong Native American voice on the Parks Forward Commission. Mm -hmm. um, and. I mean, could I just, I mean, you know, my, my thought about that is that, that there, are, there are many different cultural ways of thinking about nature mm -hmm. and of 
relating with nature, caring about nature, talking about nature, and that, you know, um, John Muir represents one of them. And, you know, an important one in, in, in our, you know, in, in the history of the United States and of conservation and, and, and environmentalism, but only one of them. And that one of the things that we need to do is really to begin to ask that question and understand the many different ways that people do uh, culturally think about, relate to, engage, care about nature. And that's really going to help, I think it's really going to help us and that Los Angeles is a really great place to do that because it's so diverse, you know, dozens of languages, dozens of cultural backgrounds. Oh, can I leave you with like one kind of like, if I, you know, put my, have my academic hat on and say like there's this idea in anthropology, which I think is kind of, um, is really sort of, in, to just talk about the very diverse ways that people think about nature and culture, it's called multinatural perspectivalism. <laughs> Say it again. Multinatural perspectivalism. And that's the idea, and this is a bit from an anthropologist who's deeply studied um, indigenous people in the Amazon, and said, you know, that actually what is shared between you know, uh, all beings is culture. And that nature is what differs. <laughs> and and I, I mean, a kind of simple way of thinking about this is that many, for many um, indigenous peoples, um, uh, the plants, you know, and animals are other people. And, and th that is covered you know, by the notion of us, or, you know, the people. And it's actually other people who are different, you know, who are the other. <laughs> you know, it's not nature who is the other, it's those guys over there who are the other. You know, we're more closely related to the birds and the turtles and the plants and stuff. So I only bring that up as a way of saying like, hey, there's a lot of different ways of thinking about, there's a lot of different possibilities for how we think about nature and culture. Well, McDonald and John Christensen, thank you so much. For